Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can request a free digital book, Understanding Your Dreams, where you can find my other media and also where you can find my books on Amazon. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. Now here's today's episode. Curtis Didato is the owner, the president of Didato Consulting. He's an HR specialist. So I invited him to come and talk to us about work satisfaction, work relationships, AI, and how to advocate for yourself at work, as well as a few other topics. So this is going to be two interviews, and here's part one. Welcome to another episode of Life Without Baggage. I'm in the series on sharpening your coping skills. And today I have a guest who's going to discuss with us how to have healthy boundaries at work. So welcome, Curtis Didato. Thanks for having me, Tony. It's good to be here. Yeah, Curtis has done, uh, I think this is the fifth podcast with me. And let me give you his background. So he is the founder and the president of Didato Consulting. He has a master's in business administration from Ohio University. He earned that in 2015. He has a certification in human resources. It's the SHRM SCP certification. And he's had an interesting and varied career in human resources, in coaching, in teaching, and his interests right now in are in the areas of employee development, mental health, identity, and growth mindsets. So he is perfect for this podcast, and he happens to be my nephew. So Curtis, why don't you fill us in on what you see as common problems that people run into that cause them undue stress in the work environment? Of course. So before we get into that, Tony, I just want to provide a little bit of context, I would say, just about how relationships play out in the workplace and from what I've researched and what I've talked with many people across professions in HR. So I want to just provide a little context before we get into that. So I first want to frame this in saying that um, statistically, relationships across the workplace are bad. I don't know how else to put it. I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't want to be like, oh, well, they're improving. They're bad. Um, across the United States, that there are roughly one third of employees that are consider themselves engaged with their jobs year in and year out. And this isn't just like a 2024, 2023. This has been pretty much year after year. It's a third of employees that are engaged. So what to me, employee engagement means is to be in order to be engaged with your job, that there has to be an emotional connection. And for an emotional connection to be present, there have to be meaningful relationships. So what I've seen workplaces do in being in the work, uh, being in the HR space for some time is that oftentimes that these employee engagement strategies that they have are going to be around compensation philosophies, training, development, recruiting, you know, onboarding, all of the things that are you can process and systematize. And they're all good. I don't want to say like those are bad. They are all good. But where the employee engagement initiatives are really missing, missing out is the importance of meaningful workplace relationships. So there is this statistic um, that Gallup Research, and I pull a lot of research from Gallup, um, they do worldwide studies, they, they're very much validated, mm-hmm. is that they find 70% of all employee engagement variability is due to the employee-manager relationship. So the most important relationship that people have is their, their direct boss, because they want to be supported, they want to be directed, they want to have help understanding you know, what they're trying to do. But unfortunately, 82% of managers that are hired lack leadership skills, which include relationship building, accountability, and clear communication. 
So already we're starting off on a bad foot to say that the people who are supposed to be guiding and leading typically don't have those skills. Now, the reason that often happens is because uh, let's say that there's somebody who is very proficient in their skill. They're a great individual contributor. And what organizations typically say is to say, well, if they're really good at that job, likely they're going to be good at leading teams and helping to manage. But individual achievement is not a predictor for leadership or relational skills. And yet we continue, Tony, we continue to see this time and time and time again, um, that people that lead the, don't have good people skills. Yeah, that's that's a, a good introduction to this whole idea. It makes sense, too, because maybe someone who is great at IT solving problems, uh, you know, brainstorming, fixing software, you put them in charge of the department, that IT does not promote people skills. So that could be disastrous for everybody involved. So people are, are already probably starting out in the hole. <laughs> Which isn't a good place. And again, I'm not painting this like <laughs> really good uplifting beat, but I want to be realistic about just the workplace that if people are struggling with workplace relationships, just know that likely you're in the same boat with just about everybody else. Um, now I want to hit one other st one other statistic real quickly, and then we'll we'll continue on with the conversation. Sure. But in addition to the employee manager relationship, um, there's also research that shows when you have a best friend at work, you are seven times as likely to be engaged with your job. So it's not just this vertical relationship, but it's also these horizontal relationships. Hmm. However, only two in ten employees say that they have a best friend at work. So we're looking at this to say, OK, you have an 18 percent chance of having a manager with people skills and you have a 20 percent chance that you have a best friend at work. So statistically, you're somewhere around you've got a 20 percent, 19 percent chance that you have healthy and meaningful relationships at work. Now, I don't want to continue. I don't want to you know, put all the blame on employers and workplaces because, Tony, this is where I look at, you know, relationships holistically. And so when we look at outside of work statistics, 50% of marriages end in divorce. So it's likely that as children, we have parents whose relationship didn't last. So likely we don't have good models to draw from. When we were in school, there was no curriculum on how to build meaningful relationships. And then if we just watch any TV, any media, any news, any reality TV, tell me the last time that healthy relationships and healthy boundaries were being modeled in a TV show that was somewhat exciting. Nobody it wants to watch those. Exactly, because they're boring. And I'm in the same boat. Like, I want excitement. I want some of this. But these aren't modeled. So I will say that healthy relationships just aren't normal in work. They're not normal, normal per se in life either. So a little bit, we're all starting in, unfortunately, I think a little bit starting in the hole. Because when we talk, you know, when we have struggles at work with the relationships, we talk about them at home. And when we're at home, we talk about the difficulties of our workplace relationships. Mm. So that's where I look at all of this to say that it's relationship skills and boundaries, especially can be very, very tough because it's not clean on either side. Yeah. And it puts pressure or opportunity for each of us to be as healthy as we can and to be proactive if there's something we need or something we want, as opposed to, I always talk about being passive and waiting for something to get better. That's yeah. that's not how life works. And it's certainly not how, you know, the, the uh, workplace operates. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, I think that there's like these underlying tones at work, like, well, everyone should get along and everyone should, you know, be in harmony with one another. But to transition this over into Tony and getting to your initial question, and sorry to take that little bit of a... No, that's a fine. That's helpful. There. Okay. It's just to get into these boundaries conversations. And in my perspective, boundaries um, serve two purposes. Number one, they're there to protect our personal energy, which is very, very important, which I think a lot of times that's what we talk about boundaries. And again, I think that most Americans are probably pretty good at overextending themselves. You know, I... Talk to just about anybody and be like, hey, what's going on with you, especially when they have kids? It's we're going from kid activity. We've got five nights a week and then we're doing this on the weekend. And then I'm like, when do you have time to shut down your brain? Because if there's no time to shut down your brain, you can't do some of these reflective opportunities and to 
to really understand what's going on. So that is very, very important. But I also what I feel like is very important in the boundaries conversation is also how to protect relationships. And that's something I don't think that we talk about quite as much, but I look at, again, in work and in life, that there are very meaningful relationships and there are ones that have more priority and more importance than others. So what are we doing to actively protect those? So in the workplace, this is where it starts to get super, super messy because oftentimes we don't protect our energy well and we don't know how to protect relationships. And then it's just a free for all of anything goes as long as we're doing what our manager or our bosses or our jobs ask. Mm. So in the workplace, I'd say, number one, just getting back to protecting our energy. Um, I've just noticed to try to say the word no in a workplace environment does not go over well. And I think a lot of employees have trouble doing that because if they do say no, there's always in the back of the head, whether it be spoken or unspoken, well, is this going to look bad for my career? Am I not? Am I going to look like I'm not a team player? You know, is everybody else around me doing the same thing? And, you know, what what's that going to look like for me? Um, am I not going to get my promotion? Am I not going to get a raise? Am I going to get you know, demoted if I say no to an after hours continued request that everybody else is in there. That's where it's important about having a, a, I always emphasize, and again, just looking at these statistics, like we were talking about before, having healthy workplace culture. Um, I was talking with, I was speaking with a group of HR professionals last week, and we were talking about this saying no concept. And we, we dug into it a little bit, you know, what do you do if you have a manager who's consistently calling um, emailing, messaging, you know, six, seven o'clock at night or on weekends. And they did point out because I, you know what, that's, you got to turn it off at some point, you know, there's other things that are going on, but what they did say, and I did appreciate this as a say, depending on the field that you're in, say you're a CPA, for instance, probably this time of year, you're not going to be able to say, Hey, I've got to dial it off at five o'clock. But there are right. going to be some seasonal rushes to be like, I've got to be on call. This is just the nature of the game. But if it's ongoing outside of these rushes, like, why? Like, what is so important that things need to be done at all times of day? So this is where I like to say, you know, there's all these, as we call fire drill moments that people can think are super, super, super important. But in my perspective, these fire drills, nine times out of 10 can wait. If it's not life threatening, if it's not like something that needs done, it's it's a lot of times people's poor planning that they need to help have help with. Hey, I need this now. Hey, I need. Th well, if you would have just talked about this two weeks ago, we could have got this. But we aren't in charge. We can't change other people how they're going to be proactive or reactive. So that's when it comes back to us as employees and to say, you've got to feel comfortable saying no or else everything else is just you're just going to be a pushover. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of the podcast you and I did over the summer of narcissism at work. It's an incumbent upon us to be polite and say, you know, wow, I, I wish I could help you, but I don't have any extra time this week. And it's such a good way to frame it. You know, it's not like, I, I feel like a lot of times we can talk about boundaries in the workplace that it can feel standoffish, but it's almost as if you have to make a pitch for yourself it's not as a matter of, you know, you don't need to put together a, a 10 or 15 page PowerPoint to say, OK, number one, I would like to have better boundaries. Now, it's it's not like that. It can just be to say, you know, as simple as um, I'm having difficulty prioritizing what is important. Can you help me understand, you know, what what are the most important things that we need to get done versus this request coming in, this request coming in, this request coming in to say, here's my truth. This is realistic. But I need help understanding what is the most important thing because I've got four or five different people. They all need this by next week, but I can only get so much of this done. So I think little yeah. things like that of reframing can be very helpful. Yeah, it's important to clarify, to ask questions as opposed to get confrontational or just build up resentment and then explode or quit. That many times if you can express politely confusion or I need a clarification, or, you know, this is how my time is being spent right now, is what you're asking me to do is at a higher priority than what just came up. And if you're able to communicate, to ask questions without getting confrontational, or 
just, you know, simmer with anger and resentment. It's like people don't necessarily know how you're doing or how much you're doing unless right. you're clear. And I know sometimes right. I've encouraged people to send an email and say, okay, so these are the projects that are currently going on. I understand it. Additional help is needed with blah, blah, blah. Um, if that's something that I'm expected to do, I will need some assistance with with X, Y, Z. You know, right. advise me what you suggest so that you kind of hit the ball back in the other court and say, okay, so how would you like this to be done? And not try to juggle everything and not expect people to know what's going on. Because a lot of times... They're overwhelmed with their own stuff, right? And I've seen that plenty of times. You know, everyone just keeps, again, it goes back to that, you know, not keeping time for yourself when you're so busy at work, when it just feels like you're in a hamster wheel to try to take a moment and to say, okay, what does everybody else have going on? Most people don't do that. And that's no fault. I'm not throwing any shade by by any means, but so many times we're just siloed, especially in remote environments. That's the end of part one with my interview with Curtis Didato. So thanks for listening. This is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. So if this helped you, share it with a friend, and we'll be talking more to Curtis next time about satisfaction at work, AI, and how to advocate for yourself in your career.